Welcome everyone. Uh, I'm Bruce Shapiro, Executive Director of the DART Center for Journalism and Trauma, a project of Columbia University Journalism School in New York City. And this is the latest installment in a series of conversations uh, with journalists, conversations for journalists, reporting and COVID-19, uh, in which we're reaching across the spectrum, not only of issues of reporting and journalism on the global pandemic, but doing the job of journalism through it. Um, this series of conversations twice a week is co-sponsored by uh, my colleagues at Columbia Journalism School, and it's part of the ongoing work of the DART Center funded by uh, the Kenneth B. DART Foundation. Um, my guest today, I'm very happy to say, is John Moore, a photographer and senior correspondent for Getty Images. Uh, John has won the Pulitzer Prize, last year's World Press photo for, I think, the defining image on the refugee crisis, the border crisis in the U.S. of a, of, of a crying Honduran child. Um, but he also has become one of the key chroniclers of the COVID-19 pandemic in the U.S., beginning with its first appearance in Seattle and more recently in New York City and the New York City suburbs. Um, John ha brings a wealth of experience to this, not only covering crisis in general, but uh, covering pandemic. He also photographed the Ebola uh, outbreak in Africa and has learned the hard way, the craft of staying safe, the crafts of working with distressed patients and medical personnel. And we'll talk about some of those things today. Um, the way this will work for those of you who are new to this series is John and I will talk, oh, for about 20 minutes or so, and then we'll go to you on the Zoom uh, call for questions and what you should do. In fact, you can do it even before we go officially to the questions is, is use the chat, start chatting your questions in. Um, we will... Um, take them as we can, try to sort them into some sort of reasonable order, may not get to everybody. I also want to welcome people watching on Facebook Live. Um, there, there's not a way to interact, but we do welcome your participation and engagement. Uh, John, it's good to see you. Thanks for being here. Thank you. It's great to see you too, Bruce. Um, for anyone who's been watching, following news coverage of this, I think we have, have seen a lot of your pictures. And what's really striking to me about so many of them is the combination of, of intimacy, of uh, intense focus on people in the throes often of medical procedures, of being transported by ambulance, of um, otherwise being treated. Um, and yet there's a, a lot of dignity, a lot of kind of respect in them. I'm going to share one image here, which has become pretty famous. Um, this, is, uh, this is a patient being intubated in their home in Yonkers, New York. And I should say that, that John has made the decision to do a lot of this work in the suburbs and outer edges of the New York area. Um, here in Yonkers, um, in Stamford, Connecticut, his own hometown uh, and mine, and other um, places in the New York area. We may talk a little bit about that, but John, let me begin by talking a little bit about this picture, which seems to me so emblematic of, of the work that you've been doing. It is up close, it is intimate, um, it's capturing a procedure that a lot of people, even though we hear about it, would rather not think about, let alone look at. Um, why did you, why have you decided to focus so many of your pictures on these kinds of moments, the inside the ambulance, being put onto a gurney, almost the procedural experience of coronavirus, coronavirus patients? 
Well, I think uh, Bruce in general, uh, the story in much of the media, certainly uh, television media has focused on um, statistics and just how many cases there are, um, how many people have died state by state. Uh, in fact, uh, on cable TV, you can see basically a stats column on the right side of the screen, which ticks up with every new case, uh, which I, I'm not a big fan of. Um, I, yeah. I like to think of this crisis in a more personal and human way. And so for me, making those pictures often has uh, a lot to do with access, whether it's the COVID story of 2020 here, or whether it's um, people being evicted from their homes in the foreclosure crisis uh, some years ago. Getting uh, access is key because although uh, writers, um, of course, uh, and report best when they're there on the scene, they can also t talk with people after the fact, whereas photojournalists, of course, we have to be there. And so I want to be um, the pictures to be as intimate as possible while still trying to respect uh, people and uh, both the people I'm photographing on the EMS side and, and the patients as well to show them um, even in a, in a tough time in, uh, in a way that's dignified. But getting that, that dignity and that access are both kind of challenging craft issues. I mean, medical right. access is notoriously hard to get for any journalist uh, let alone a photographer, right? What are some of the, you know, you, you, you're you not mostly, most of your shots are not mostly inside hospitals this time around. In Africa, a lot of your shots were. Um, right. What's your reporting process? What's been, what kind of steps have you gone through to gain the kind of access to ride along with EMS crews to, be in these kinds of situations? I, I found during this story, as in other uh, crises I've covered, that, that personal connections make a huge difference. And uh, going through the bureaucratic pro uh, process of, of applying for uh, media access to a hospital is, uh, is oftentimes a fool's errand. Uh, and that would go for EMS and almost any clinic uh, because uh, because they're you know everyone in the United States is afraid of lawsuits. Um, let's just get that out there. That's, yeah. that's what hospitals are afraid of. And so even um, even though the, a journalist may have credentials uh, from having done important work in the past, um, or may have a reputation for treating people with respect, if the hospital or the clinic does not have any connection to that person at all, they may see one with uh, quite a bit of suspicion and fear. And so. Uh, in the case of EMS, and I'm going to be in a hospital uh, this coming weekend, mm -hmm. um, it's always some sort of personal connection that, that can vouch for my reputation. So I, I know that sounds really basic, but <laughs> on this story in general, uh, it's, been, it's been that way. I photographed in people's homes, uh, people who were quarantined and sick, mm -hmm. and, and they let me into their lives because I've been introduced to them by, for instance, someone more, more, uh, who runs a nonprofit who they have a relationship with. Mm -hmm. And so I've, I've really, um, on the COVID-19 story, it is for, for journalists, basically, if you go and you get in touch with everyone on any story that you've ever worked on, who trusts you, someone that you uh, worked with and who, who, you, who felt good about the story that you did, if you get back in touch with them and say, what kind of, um, how are you doing? And are there any stories that I should be looking at, whether it's an e economic uh, story or a health story or anything that you've covered for the last 10 years, that person will remember the story, the, the good job that you did, mm -hmm. and they will put you in contact because everyone now has a COVID story um, in one form or fashion. And so it's easier to get involved uh, by casting a wide net with contacts who trust you. In the case of uh, EMS, I, uh, I was put in touch uh, with the, the uh, public affairs person for that EMS in Yonkers by a different EMS chief in Stanford who I'd worked with, who had been rec received a rec uh, recommendation from someone in my neighborhood. Um, I, even more interesting, 
I photographed a um, a birthday um, a birthday caravan mm -hmm. of families going past a child's house in my neighborhood in Stamford, Connecticut. The person who was in charge of the neighborhood association said, "Hey, John, do you mind giving us some pictures for our, our website, our newsletter?" And I said, "Sure." And I said, hey, by the way, you wouldn't know anyone involved in EMS. So I'm trying to get uh, started on something. And she said, hmm, I've got a friend who is EMS, but she's now in Texas, but I'll get in touch with her. She put me in touch with the chief in Stanford. I photographed them for four days. He put me in touch with the chief in Yonkers, and I've been working with them ever since. So um, it, when, I, when I'm covering any story, I want that particular story always to lead to another one. <laughs> uh, and it may be the same field or it may be something different, but that's what I found over my, the course of my career allows me to keep working on stuff that I'm interested in is, is from one story to lead to another constantly. And uh, that is a long answer to your question. No, but no, but it's, is, it's uh, a great one. And it's process. interesting because it parallels um, something we heard uh, last week uh, from Aaron Glantz, another Dart Center Rock fellow who's an investigative journalist. And he too said, lean into who you know, lean into what you know, and essentially go back to people you have reported on in the past, because this has changed everyone's lives. They're all going to have something, right? That's, that's, that's exactly right. Uh, and I, a hundred percent more on this story than almost anything else I've covered, because this, this is a story that is not, um, it's not uh, uh, abstract to the people that I know and my, my neighbors or my family. When I've covered conflicts overseas, uh, when I've covered um, epidemics in other places like Ebola uh, in Liberia, mm. it was very abstract to uh, most of the people I know, aside from that core of, of, of journalists uh, who I can share with uh, my experiences. It was very abstract for everyone else. You know, it's like that Thanksgiving conversation that is, uh, that everyone will ask you, well, what were you doing last year? And you say, well, you know, I was covering Ebola and they're very interested for about five seconds and then their eyes goes over <laughs> because it's very far from their experience yeah. and they don't have anything to share uh, in, in that conversation. But in the COVID story, everyone has something to share. And so uh, that is, is useful uh, for us as journalists. And I, and I hope in, um, in areas that, that you're a special, specialist in, Bruce, yeah. it will be useful for us as journalists to be able to talk about our experiences, not just with a core of other journalists, but with normal people at the dinner table, that, that, um, that friends, family, and pe everyone will be able to have some, um, to be able to connect to our experience because they have their own experience too. Are, are you finding that these images, which for an American, audience are remarkably close to home. You know, Yonkers, Stamford, these are anybody's, <coughs> excuse me, anybody's suburb. Um, are you getting different kinds of feedback than you might get from, let's say, Africa or the border? Um, you know, I have not had, um, so, sometimes I pay attention to the comments section of, uh, of Twitter and Instagram, and sometimes I don't. Uh, when mm -hmm. I'm really busy, I pay less attention to it. Uh, mm -hmm. which is probably a healthy thing. But I, I think uh, from what I've seen so far, uh, most people uh, uh, applaud photojournalists who are trying to show the heroic import and important work being done yeah. by first responders and, and hospital and medical staff. That mm -hmm. is the overwhelming sort of uh, feeling I'm getting right now. And I think that, um, I think that from the work that I've seen published, uh, other than my own, uh, is, uh, my work and others, I think uh, photojournalists are being very careful to to treat people with respect uh, in the in this process mm -hmm. and uh is it different from overseas well i think uh every every place every culture has has its own cultural sensitivities um in some parts of the world people are really interested in you showing their story because they feel that the world is not paying attention um for whatever personal reason they may have they may want you to enter their lives or they may not want you to um, that's the case in the U.S. as well, and um, every European countries have different levels. Uh, in, in Germany, for instance, it's very, very hard even for street photographers because they need to have permission from every single person in their picture. Um, yeah. That society is very different from ours, which uh, has a reality TV culture as well, mm -hmm. which uh, um, which is a whole other thing. But um, 
But I think uh, knowing the cultural sensitivities and trying to pay attention to that and be respectful of that is important in, uh, in a story as it, as it is in all of them. And in this case, and just to stay with access for one more minute, and then we'll talk about some actual photo choices. Um, you are gaining access to show people in extremis. What are the kinds of ethical guideposts, guidelines, practices that you use um, just to get in the door with the camera? How have you thought about that? Well, when, when EMS arrives, um, the EMS uh, lieutenant or captain, who is um, the paramedic, the supervisor mm -hmm. that I'm working with, um, they will ask the family straight away. They'll say, um, John Moore from Getty Images is working on a picture story about EMS showing this very tough uh, situation and us mm -hmm. helping the folks out. Is it okay if he comes in and photographs up us at work with, with uh, your family member or with you? And, uh, and if they say that's, that's okay, then, um, then I'll come in. And if they say, no, um, we prefer not, then I'll wait outside. And it, it's really that simple. And once I'm inside, um, the, you know, the, the number one is to stay out of everyone's way because the medical mission is a million times more important than what I'm doing. And so I'll stay back and I'll, and, and I'll talk with the medics and I'll say, look, if I'm in any way in your, in your, uh, in your way, please let me know. And they're like, you're fine, don't worry. And, um, and I'm usually hanging back. Sometimes I'll get a little bit closer. Um, the, I'm wearing PPE, of course. Now I, I go in, I tend to go in with my own PPE. Um, the medics, they're almost always um, offering some of theirs, but my, uh, <laughs> I, I kind of don't want to use their, their uh, precious uh, PPE because it is yeah. precious. The EM, uh, EMTs and medics I've worked with have had, had a, a good stock of it. They're not, not running out, but I try to use my own, uh, which I have a, a small stock of. As, um, as photojournalists working in this situation, we don't have a huge amount of PPE, nor do we need it. Yeah. Um, but we have just, I have just enough to make sure that I'm safe in these environments. Sometimes I'm wearing a Tyvek suit, uh, which is a full body suit. I I'm, I'm always have gloves on. Um, I may, I'll either have an N95 mask on or I'll have a full face uh, uh, respirator, mm -hmm. which has uh, filters. Mm -hmm. And that's usually what I, I use more often than not. When it's a COVID call on an EMS story, I'll wear the, I'll wear the uh, respirator. Uh, which gives me uh, more protection. Yeah. Well, let me ask a, a similar ethics question, but this time about craft. Again, you're photographing people at what is possibly the worst moment of their lives, and in some cases may unfortunately be the last, some of the last moments of their lives. Um, you're making a lot of aesthetic judgments in the moment, craft judgments, and craft judgments later when you decide what to print. Um, thinking back to that photo we looked at at the beginning of, of, of the talk, there's all kinds of stuff going on in it. There, it's this individual is being intubated beneath their wedding portrait. There's kind of red, white, and blue light going on all over the place. It's a very, um, and there's a lot of suburban normality in it too, in that picture in Yonkers. Um, either in the moment or later, what are the ethics of the image in that moment? What's voyeuristic, what's sensational, what works? How have you thought that one through in this case? Well, I, I can speak to that, that whole scene in general. Um, mm -hmm. There are many other pictures that, that, show, um, that show family members in the background that I didn't use. There are, there are many pictures where you can see the gentleman's face uh, which I did were not included in my edit either. Mm -hmm. Those with um, a whole wall of photos uh, of family photos on the wall, and mm -hmm. uh, and because I couldn't you know get in touch with all those people, um, I decided no best uh, or we decided to, to get a best to best not to include those in the edit. So mm -hmm. uh, a lot of pictures are not included. So I, I winnowed it winnowed it down uh, to a fairly narrow set. The, um, I thought that the wedding picture on the wall um, just humanized the issue uh, even yeah. more. That, uh, that, for the record, is, uh, is not the gentleman uh, and, his, and his wife, but rather um, another family member. Um, and, 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 and so it's not, it's not him on the wall. So 
but it, but it did humanize this picture even more because I'm not uh, I'm not showing uh, his face. I, I was I treaded in a really delicate way in that situation, and, and intubation is um, a very invasive procedure, and many people who are intubated, especially over a certain age, may not come off the ventilator, and uh, and it, it may be a where the family members are saying goodbye um, for the last time. And I, uh, I tried to be sensitive. Uh, and I was speaking, in fact, uh, with his daughter who was there on the scene. I w he was staying with his daughter in his daughter's house. Okay. And I was talking with her uh, a fair amount. And, um, and then I, I, called, I called her um, later in the day to follow up to see how they were doing and uh, was in touch with them one more time because I, I just wanted to follow up and see how they were. Do, and, we, know, um, do we know what, what has happened to the gentleman? I, I do not. Um, I, I ended up continuing uh, with EMS and, and working on many other other cases. Yep. And I, I I don't know at this time uh, what happened to him. I uh, you know I I, w I wish them the best. And um, I I at some point I'm in communication with families, but um, at some point I want to leave it up to them if they want to continue being in touch with me. I yep. I, um, I want to be sensitive. It's, it's it's so sensitive. All these cases are so sensitive. I'm, I'm constantly trying to reassess and, uh, and not overstep and try and tell their story uh, in, a, in as sens sensitive way as I can. One of the things that struck me in looking at these pictures is especially the, these, the Stanford pictures. As I said, as you and I were talking about earlier, I grew up in the town in which you now live. So right. Stanford Hospital, some of those other locations are places that I know and recognize literal streets um how what is different about doing this story in your own community that you're not mostly a local journalist no no it's uh, it, it is um yes i never expect a, a, a skill set that i that i learned in western africa of using personal protection equipment mm -hmm. to be useful um here where i live that was never um that was never part of it, but uh, but it is now, and I think I think a lot of the assumptions that we had about ourselves as journalists and what we would cover, and our assumptions about society in general have been updated uh, in the, the last couple of months, and yeah. uh, and we realized that uh, that a, a, a global uh, crisis um, is truly a gl global crisis. It's not just a global crisis on the other side of the world. And so yes, it's it's surreal for me to to cover it here. I'm you know I'm obviously trying to be very careful. I have a family uh, myself, and uh, I you know I I follow the best practices uh, that I can in terms of uh, staying safe. My uh, you know it's it's very important for me to stay safe for myself. No one wants to get sick in this profession, but also uh, the thoughts of you know cont of, of infecting anyone else. So I'm, I'm super careful about that. But I'm also mindful that um, healthcare workers, many have been infected, we know that. Yeah. But they are physically handling people. They are yeah. all day long. They're physically touching, handling, switching out PPE, putting on new, uh, decontaminating, um, doing it all over. It's a, it's a, it's a process that is, is specific in the order in which it has to happen. And after people have worked many 12-hour shifts or 24-hour shifts in a row they can make mistakes um, and I think many of the many of the uh, healthcare professionals who have become infected uh, probably something happened either they didn't have the, uh, enough uh, protective clothing mm -hmm. or they made a mistake after all this uh, work and so I'm trying to measure what I do and um, knowing full well that as a photojournalist I'm never touching a patient uh, nor am I leaning into a, uh, a patient the way they have to. And I'm standing back and the only thing I'm touching in that room are, are my cameras and the bottoms of my feet on the floor. Uh, um, <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. When you're working in that environment, uh, you're hyper alert. And uh, in photographing EMS uh, in some ways is, a, uh, is, is my PPE level can be at a certain level uh, say a high level, but when I'm photographing in a, uh, a, the home of a, some people who are um, infected, uh, who are sick and quarantined, 
which I've done several times. I'm in full Tyvek uh, with the hood and boot covers and yeah. the mask and several layers of gloves, which all have to come off in order. And uh, I, I vary the levels of PPE because in someone's home where everyone's sick, you have to assume that every single surface is, uh, is contaminated. And yeah. unlike an EMS call, where I'm only going in for five minutes and coming out. When I go into someone's home, it's, a, it's for a long period of time. So uh, I, I vary the levels and, uh, and try to do, uh, do it all right. And uh, so far, so good. We'll go to questions in a minute. So folks, you should start uh, chatting them in as I see a couple of people already have. Um, but in, in addition to the physical PPE, um, on, this, on this particular story maybe, what are you, what are you doing for your personal self-care? I mean, what, this, is, this is high stress by any, by any chart. It's first of all, you're out there with EMS crew, so it's exhausting. It's ourselves in our ordinary lives at risk rather than a containable crisis elsewhere. Uh, you, you got your own family, all of that. How are you thinking about your psychological or, or other non-physical self-care on this one? Well, time will tell. Um, mm -hmm. But so far, I, I, I really do think that being able to discuss the story yeah. um, with my neighbors mm -hmm. over the fence or, you know, distanced in the street as we're all taking a walk or with my family or with my extended family, being able to talk about this with a, a wide range of people is very helpful for me personally. It's not, uh, um, you know, uh, you and I have, you know, years ago had this discuss discussion as well when I was a DART fellow. Yeah. Um, we often rely heavily on our colleagues uh, who have ex had the same experiences. Um, but in this case, so many people have had this experience, at least on, in some uh, form or fashion, at least with I uh, isolation and social distancing and the bombardment of television news, that... Uh, that I think it's a little bit, uh, to, call, to say it's a healthier story to cover uh, is uh, outrageous, but uh, I think in the long term, um, I hope it is uh, compared to uh, photographing in some distant land where what I did for that three weeks is so abstract to everyone I know that they can't even uh, have a conversation about it. So I, I, I'm hopeful that this will, um, that this will be better in that way. So here, let's go to questions. And here's an interesting one from Stephen Douglas uh, who, about stigmatization. Uh, he says, after I worked at an Ebola treatment center and followed all safety protocols, I found people were wary of me. Are you finding that with your workplace exposure and your job being as visible as it, visible as it is, are people being nervous around you at all? Well, you know, because we're, um, we're socially distanced from most everyone we know. Uh, it's hard to tell so far, but um, you know, come come summer uh, and, and fall, I might be able to report back on that. If if, <laughs> if I ask someone uh, uh, out for a friend out for a drink and and they they uh, politely dec decline, and as does everyone else, that I'll know that there's an issue. <laughs> but um, I th I think that uh, I think that the because there's the uh, what is it for. 14 day incubation period. I think that once um, those weeks pass, uh, it, I think that it will be less in this case, actually. Because Ebola was so abstract for most Americans, I mean, there were a couple of cases in Texas, but there, were, there weren't that many cases in the US. Because it was so abstract, it was, I think, freakier for people in general. Whereas COVID-19, I think by now, almost everyone knows someone who has it. And uh, if they're not really close to them, they know it's, you know, two streets over. Yeah. So, uh, so I, I, I'm hoping that the, uh, there will not be as much uh, of that um, shame in, in this particular uh, case. But, but we'll, we'll see, time will tell. Yeah, uh, again, um, we're talking to John Moore and uh, folks on the Zoom chat, please do um, send some questions in. Um, let me ask you another sort of photographer's question. Your pictures, your pictures are also beautiful, many of them. How do you, what's the balance of beauty and horror? How do you think, how do you think that went through on this story? I mean, there's some, when you're showing medical workers out on the street or even the, the photograph of 
um, I think, believe it's a nurse in doing a report in a car at the end of a shift. That's an, uh, an e exhausted but quite striking image. But in the images involving ambulances and treatment and EMTs and intubation and all this, this, this could be shocking material there's also an aesthetic to it. What what is the sort of the John Moore aesthetic in a in these pictures, and and what are the? And I'm thinking of it as an ethical question, not in a sort of abstract way. Well, for me, um, no matter what story I'm on, uh, whether it be the COVID nineteen story or an immigration story, or you know, I was recently in Australia for the, the mm -hmm. effect of the wildfires, uh, bushfires on the wildlife there. I mean, I'm always trying to make a, a picture aesthetic, aesthetically appealing, not for photography in itself, but rather to draw people into the photojournalism. Because people see so many hundreds, thousands of, of images every day, whether it's on, um, you know, on, on their phones or on the TV or wherever, we're bombarded with pictures. So. If you can't if you can't get someone's attention, they're going to swipe past it, swipe, 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 and and they're gone. It's less than a second. So if you can engage them visually in the story that you're trying to tell, then they will linger on, on that photo and spend time to read the caption. And once they've read the caption, they started to become invested in the story, mm -hmm. and and then we've done our job because our mm -hmm. our, our job isn't to um, isn't uh, just to report in a dry way uh, for the record. Our, our, our job is to report visually in a way that draws people in, um, in an environment where they're bombarded with many issue, uh, photographs every day. And that's, and you, that's yeah. why uh, I try to make my pictures aesthetically pleasing as, as a lure to bring people into the story. Mm -hmm. And you, you also, m more than some photographers, not more than all, but more than some, back up your photographic worth work with a lot of reporting. You, you do a fair amount of reporting. Right. What's, what's led you to that and what are you looking, what are you looking for in your reporting that complements the images? I'm, I'm always trying to give context to the pictures. And whether, whether that is in the form of uh, presenting pictures of the picture story, mm -hmm. which I almost always do, or a, a photo series, uh, a series of pictures and the picture story are almost the same, but not quite. Mm -hmm. um, but I want to give context to the photographs visually with, with sometimes peripheral photos that add to the main image, mm -hmm. but also yeah. in captions. I, I want people to get to know um, the story that I'm trying to tell. And it, that may have to do with more details about the people I'm photographing, or it may just be more detail on the story. On, for instance, when I put a picture out uh, for Getty Images, I'm using the basic information with, um, with its straightforward caption information. I may include extra. Um, in my Instagram posts, uh, for instance, I may, um, I may add a little more color mm -hmm. that, takes it, that, takes, that makes it a little bit less newsy and, and, and amplifies the, the scene a little. And so uh, it really depends on the medium. But typically, I'm... Uh, my work is going to be straightforward, both in the photography and in the um, in the captioning. And, 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 and on social yeah. media, I'll add a little, little bit more. And then last year, you, you did an entire book of your pictures from the border of all the different players in this drama of, of migration. I imagine you thought about kind of the reporting and story in an even bigger arc in that case. Oh, for sure, because I I'd worked on that uh, project for over 10 years uh, yeah. and, and continue to because uh, some of the people I'm photographing in the COVID-19 story are, are immigrants, are undocumented immigrants. In fact, I'm working on a, a, an element of that right now, of, of pictures I haven't released yet. But I continue trying to cover that story even now because it's important to me. And, and in, the, in the book, uh, which was called Undocumented, I tried to show as many, I wouldn't say both sides, sides of the story because there's so many sides of that story yeah. it's a it's a, yeah. it, it's a story that will always keep giving because there's so many not just people but angles and so i was trying to show both immigrants coming up and uh u.s uh, law enforcement like border patrol and what they do and trying to show them uh, all as as human beings um in this 
giant story. And uh, I continue to do that. And, and in a way, hopefully, that all sides can look at and, uh, and appreciate. Yeah. Um, Maria Arce, another Ockberg fellow, uh, says, hi, John. Uh, have you detected any needs or requirements that newsrooms ought to be covering or taking into account for journalists during this coverage beyond the PPE? What are the, what should newsrooms who are trying to look out for their staff be attending to here? Well, I can tell you in the case of Getty Images, um, the management uh, of this company has been very clear to photographers um, in the field that if they don't uh, feel comfortable covering the story, they don't have to at all. And they've repeated that because they, they, they know that uh, everyone's comfort level is going to be uh, quite a bit different. Our, uh, imagine Getty Images has a huge sports staff, bigger than the new staff. Um, because we're the official agency, uh, not only do we cover every sport, but we're the official agency of almost every professional league in the world, <laughs> including the Olympics and FIFA. And, and, and all those photographers do not have events on the schedule anymore. And so many of our sports photographers have, have become news photographers or mm -hmm. feature photographers covering this story in one angle or another. And so everyone's comfort level, um, if you're not covering news on a daily basis, is going to be very different. Than, yeah. than others. Of course, my comfort level on this story is, is greater because I've covered you know, such uh, traumatic type stories in the past. Yeah. In fact, the reason why you and I met is because I had photographed the assassination of Benazir Bhutto in Pakistan. That's right. Back in the end of 2007. That's right. And, and, and so um, my level of risk management is gonna be different uh, from yeah. others. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I'm not going to say I don't fear the virus, but I, I have a, I hope am handling the risk management um, mm -hmm. in a way that's that's acceptable and uh, and effective. Mm. Uh, Angelina Fusco uh, also. This is a boom season for Rockberg fellows asking questions. Angelina Fusco, who uh, headed BBC Northern Ireland's newsroom through much of the troubles says some journalists and photographers are raising questions about how to find time out amid this kind of constant bombardment of news updates and social media posts on, on the pandemic. And people, journalists sometimes feel guilty. Um, how do you handle that? Any, any advice for finding time out, how to feel about it, any of that? Well, um, I mean, it's easier for me to find some time out because I'm, I'm covering the story from home. Yeah. Um, usually when I'm covering a, a, a big international story, I'm, I'm, not, I'm many time zones uh, away from where I actually live. And so you really can't get away from the story there. But, uh, but here, um, once I'm done, I'll, I'll play with my five-year-old son. I'll, um, I'll get on a Zoom dinner with my, uh, with my daughters. <laughs> I will, um, you know, uh, yesterday I lay in the hammock. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, so I have been able to find some ways uh, uh, to get away from the story. Uh, naturally, uh, because, because I know that how to do the story, I hope, um, I, I'm staying very busy. But th there, is, there, is, uh, there is time I can find because I'm at home. Um, yeah. it's, it's, I find it a little bit easier. If I, in the course of this coverage, if I'm having to travel to other places, then it'll be a, a different situation, of course. Yeah. Trent Daniel is wondering, since this is a room full of colleagues here, um, is there anyone whose work, maybe either on the pandemic or at least of the moment, whose images you are particularly admiring right now? Any other photojournalists whose work stands out that we should be paying attention to right now? Well, there's, yes, there's, there's various. Um, uh, Victor Blue uh, from, uh, has photographed uh, inside hospitals for the New York Times very powerful work. Um, Rodrigo Abd in, in Peru is doing, uh, is doing incredible work showing how the epidemic is, uh, is affecting uh, people in a developing world country. Uh, Philip Montgomery uh, for the New York Times Magazine has done some stunning, stunning and very different work, um, very artistic and, and uh, very interesting work uh, for the New York Times Magazine. There's, there's others, uh, colleagues, uh, friends that I'm going to forget and uh, and please forgive me, uh, uh, <laughs> but there, I mean, there's probably 
Um, we've lost you there for a minute. Who, on, who use Instagram uh, story post. He is featuring, yeah. for those of you um, using Instagram, if you follow David Gudenfelder, he is actually on his Instagram stories uh, postings, highlighting the work of photographers around the world covering the COVID-19 story. And so that is a way to look and see the incredible work that's being done uh, by many different people. Mm -hmm. Let me ask a question as a, maybe a, a way of wrapping in the next five minutes or so, although if people have one or two more questions, feel free to chat them in. Um, a lot of my, our students at Columbia Journalism School are coming to the year of their, the end of the year of their, their master's degrees and they're going out in the world to commit acts of journalism. And of course, they find themselves now reporting on the crisis. It's the story. The pandemic is the story. Um, if you were advising a young photojournalist who had just been assigned to go out and go out and find me some some pandemic pictures, um, how what would you how would you advise a young journalist to begin approaching this story? And what would be your sort of top two or three tips for a new journalist? new photojournalists looking at, at this crisis? Well, in terms of uh, protecting oneself physically, we've, you know, th that's pretty readily available um, information to get. People yeah. talk about that all the time, whether it's uh, um, covering your face or, or a, a certain type of N95 mask or gloves or whatever, that, that information is available. Uh, what I would say is, um, don't think so much about uh, working in the most infectious environments. Think more about um, everyone that you know, who who trusts you, uh, who uh, whether they're friends or whether they're friends of friends. One uh, uh, the homeschooling pictures I did in New Rochelle, um, outside of New York City, were um, my 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 one of my wife's oldest friends. She knew a, a woman in the neighborhood who was interested in me coming. So it's friends of friends and those connections. Um, use those to, to get access to different things that, are, that don't require bureaucratic application processes. And there, there are many uh, stories to cover everywhere on this particular story. It's, um, it's a hard story and it's an easy story at the same time because there's a lot of material there and if we handle it uh, in a sensitive way, we can tell we can tell the story in a very broad way across this country and, of course, across the world. That seems as good a place as any to wind up. I think it's a kind of a clear sense of mission and purpose, which guides all of all of your work. So I, I think uh, it's as uh, as good a place as any to wind up. Um, so. John, let me thank you. I also want to make sure to thank uh, Susan Kaplan, who has been busily taking notes for uh, the DART Center's running tip sheet on coronavirus coverage, which you find at www.dartcenter.org. Uh, Kate Black and Ariel Richen have been keeping the creaky machinery of, of the internets going here for us. Um, again, my colleagues at Columbia Journalism Review, who co-sponsored and pushed this out. Um, John Moore's beautiful book, Undocumented, which I should have plugged at the beginning, is really worth getting a hold of on Amazon. It is sitting under quarantine at my desk at Columbia, so I can't hold it up for you now, but it's, it's one of the great photo books of the year and one of the best chronicles we have of, the, of 10 years of evolving border crisis. So John, thank you. Stay safe. Thank you for all the work. Keep doing it. Um, folks, we will be back Thursday continuing on a theme uh, related to visual journalism, this time focusing on documentary film. More on that in emails and posts to come. Thank you all.